I want to take you on a tour of my low voltage lighting system. Again, don't leave yet. If you've never seen one of these, you might wonder why we don't make them anymore. And if you have one, well, I'll talk about how to fix them and make them better too. First, let me quickly explain what it is I'm talking about when I say low voltage lighting system for those who might be thinking of something like landscaping lights or alternative energy lighting. I'm talking about a system we used to install in higher end homes in order to have 120 volt lighting circuits controlled by lower voltage momentary switches and relays. The primary benefits to these systems was ease of installation, the novelty of the switches, and the ability to control many circuits from one panel as well as have as many switches on one circuit as you want with very little effort. Those reasons are still valid today. In fact, most home automation enthusiasts are now installing remote buttons that require little to no wiring in the walls themselves. I have mixed feelings about a lot of the available products for this, which is why I take these kinds of things apart, but the idea is solid in my opinion. Wiring multiple switches in a strictly 120 volt AC circuit is more difficult than simply controlling the circuit with one switch and controlling that switch with some other switches. You'll get a better idea of what I'm talking about as we go. Okay, back to my system. In every room except the laundry room, a small storage room in the shop, and the game room, which was added 30 years after the house was built, I have these switches in various configurations. In the master bedroom, I have this dial, which I'll explain in a moment. I have a total of 52 individual switches that all run to this box where the old latching solenoid relays used to live. This is a big mess, but there's a few good reasons I'll discuss shortly. There were originally 24 relays in this system, but a few of them got combined by previous owners or their electricians as relays failed. Because the switches are all single pole double throw momentary switches, or rockers in other words, they can simply be wired in parallel to one another to operate the latching relays that actually turn the 120 volt circuits on and off. There's another cool trick you can do because of this. Remember the dial? Well, it's a double pole rotary switch that allows you to send two wires that are switched by the above toggle to any of nine different relays. That gives you the ability to control nine circuits from one single gang switch arrangement. It's pretty brilliant, and it was built in 1954. For more on that, be sure to check out the first video that started this channel, link in the description. The relays, as I mentioned, were latching relays, so they only required power to toggle them on or off, which makes the system even better because no control circuit is powered all the time. The relays were powered by this 24 volt AC step down, which comes with pros and cons for conversion. If you have one of these systems, what you do with this component will depend on whether or not you want to convert and how you want to convert. Usually this guy isn't an issue, but if you want to test it, it's pretty simple. Just set your meter to the 200 volt AC range and probe the terminals that have the smaller gauge wire. The voltage you read may vary depending on system, but mostly I've seen 24 to 30 volt output on these. In some unique systems, you may see a rectifier like this one right after the transformer on the smaller wires. If you do, you have DC relays, and this changes some of your options. There are some cases where if you're converting and you want to use DC relays, adding one of these could be part of your solution. If you're starting from scratch, I recommend a regulated power supply as it will give you more flexibility in the long run. I am currently using a regulated power supply because I plan to use my switch wires to power small microcontrollers over time and I want cleaner power. Even though a number of circuits together makes things seem complicated, if you look at one circuit at a time, you'll see that these systems aren't complicated at all. You have a neutral running out to your fixture as usual, then you have a hot wire that is switched by a relay. That relay is controlled by lower voltage from the momentary switches. That lower voltage is provided by the transformer. The thing that usually complicates these systems is placement. Most electricians want you to run modern standard wiring and replace the low voltage control wires, but that doesn't mean you can't simply leverage the existing system and still be code compliant. As long as you're using UL listed devices and following some general safe practices, you can retrofit the existing infrastructure. Now, I've done some things here that are probably overly cautious, and that's one reason this looks like such a mess. The first devices I purchased as part of the experiment to replace this old system were these Shelly 2.5 relays because I could fit two circuits in one device. I also purchased a few of the Shelly 1PM relays to play with and I discovered I actually preferred these because wiring two circuits to one of these little devices doesn't leave you a lot of finger space. 
The relay modules will accept a button or switch, but they rely on the same hot that feeds them to be switched and fed into the inputs. This means that an unprotected hot would be connected to these smaller gauge wires, and I don't like that because the breaker won't trip if the current limit for this wire were exceeded, meaning a break in the insulation of the wire somewhere in a wall could be a fire hazard. Not to mention a crappy old momentary switch with 70-year-old wiring mounted to a metal strap attached to a metal faceplate might spell trouble for an operator until I replace all 52. This is why I have these intermediary relays to act as 120 volt switches controlled by the lower voltage. I could have run the hots from the Shelly relays through these intermediaries and back to their switch inputs, but I wanted to be able to change what switch controlled which circuit under certain circumstances. For instance, during the day, my kitchen light switch controls the area above the kitchen, but at night it also controls the under cabinet lights for extra light. That's why I ran the switched controls to the Shelly i4s instead of the relays. Now, Shelly makes a DC version of this that I could have used without the intermediary relays, but I didn't know that at the time, and I'm actually going to be getting rid of all of this in the next couple of months. I'll talk about that in a moment. This isn't the simplest, or probably even the best way to convert one of these systems, but it allowed me to experiment. I haven't had to do much to this system since I installed the Shelly devices, but recently I've decided it's time to make this arrangement more permanent and durable. I may not be keeping this house, and I don't want the next owner to need to know what I know in order to maintain or repair the system, so I'm going to be modifying it so that it operates independent of my Wi-Fi or servers. If I do keep the house, it will keep things simpler. Eventually, I'll want to replace all the old rocker switches as well because they don't have a good snappy contact, which will eventually lead to issues, but that will be one of the last things I do. Right now, everything my system does relies on my MQTT broker. The touch panels I've built send a command on an MQTT topic that the primary panel interprets and sends out another MQTT message specific to the control device. This is also how the Shelly i4 and motion sensor messages are handled. If the primary panel that executes commands goes down, each touch panel is capable of designating itself the primary until I can fix the one that went down. There is also a web server that can pass MQTT messages to this device, which then sends the command over a serial connection to the isolated smart network. This is all great and secure, but it relies on two of my three Wi-Fi networks, and I don't want the next person to have to go in and set up all the configurations when they take ownership of the system. The way I plan to accomplish this is with several Shelly 4 Pros, which will replace all of these devices and provide a permanent network for the control system. I'll be adding one microcontroller that will be the brain of the more than a simple switch logic, and I'll be documenting the setup and code for it in case it needs to be replaced later. I'll have videos on my progress when I start the upgrade, but that won't be until it gets warm enough outside to open my garage door for light and cut the main power to the whole system. If you're an owner of one of these systems and you want to know your options, one of the best options is the Shelly 4 Pro, but you'll likely need to do something about your control wires like I've done with the intermediary relays. It may be overly cautious, but it's better than not knowing if the ancient thin gauge wires you're feeding 120 volt AC power through aren't going to become heating elements in the wall because of a stuck switch or brittle insulators. I think these systems are amazing, and I wish more houses were built with a central control box for the lighting this way, so you could put switches wherever you want without having to worry about three-way switches or a lot of rewiring. They can be a little overwhelming to convert, and some installers left absolutely awful rat's nests of wires, but if you can get through the mess, the ability to control everything from one location is really worthwhile. I'm not sure when I'll be working on the next video, as things have been a little unstable around here, but when I do, I'll be working on alternative wireless communications for sensors and smart switches, as well as creating a simple, powerful rules-based timer and trigger system using a Raspberry Pi Pico to control scenes, sensor triggering, and all sorts of other conditional control for your cloudless smart home. I do hope you enjoyed the video, and if you did and haven't already done so, please consider subscribing to the channel. If you want to know what's going on between videos, check out the social media links in the channel banner. Thanks for listening to me ramble, and I do hope you'll join me for future videos as I continue exploring smarter circuits.